101 Dalmatians 2 Patches London Adventure is a Disney-licensed action platforming game that was released in November of 2003. The game was based on the direct-to-video Disney movie of the same name that came out earlier in January of that same year. The 101 Dalmatian movies are fairly well known, but it all started in 1956 with a children's novel written by Dodie Smith. After having written a handful of stage plays in the 1930s, Dodie Smith and her husband, Alec Macbeth Beasley, were faced with the difficult decision of moving from London to the United States when Alec was drafted to serve in the military during World War II. The couple observed themselves as conscientious objectors, also known as conchies, who are individuals that claim the right to refuse military service on the grounds of freedom of thought, conscience, or religion. This major change in location had a huge impact on Dodie Smith. After having spent her whole life there, she was in love with England, and in particular London. Homesickness was the main inspiration for Dodie's 1948 novel, I Capture the Castle, which would garner major acclaim and was hailed as one of the top 200 novels in the United Kingdom by the BBC in 2003. Upon this success, Dodie and Alec went on to live lavish lives at their homes in both Beverly Hills and Malibu, California. As both of them were very much dog people, they took up adopting a large number of Dalmatians, one of which they named Pongo. And it was during one of the many dinner parties they put on that a friend made a very specific comment to Dodie about these black and white checkered pups. Those dogs, she said, would make a lovely fur coat. This turned the wheels in Dodie's head and eventually led to her completing the 101 Dalmatians in 1956. Prior to reading the book, I assumed it was going to be your basic light reading children's novel with some sort of underlying moral theme to wrap it all up in a pretty bow, but actually, I'm happy to report that there was a little more to it than that. Dodie's voice carries with it a sharp sense of humor and a keen eye for the odd behaviors of both pets and people alike. Through her narrative, it's clear that she's passionate about the furry pals in her life, and the lengths to which she goes to create an imaginary social construct within the animal kingdom are endearing. Though, admittedly, she might be the first person to bestow upon the world that basic joke of, uh, we don't own our pets, <laughs> they own us, as she pretty much says this verbatim in the first chapter. Eh, you can't really blame her for it though, since she had no way of knowing that she was giving birth to bumper sticker humor at the time. That aside, I love the way she builds Cruella de Vil into a wacky character that is actually much more fleshed out in this introductory book than she is in any of the later films. She's written as this sort of self-centered narcissist that talks over everyone and says whatever comes to her mind without any tact at all. I thought the funniest thing about her though was that for some reason she loves the taste of black pepper. At the beginning of the book she throws a dinner party and here's a description of the menu. The soup was dark purple and what did it taste of? Pepper. The fish was bright green. And what did it taste of? Pepper. The meat was pale blue. And what did that taste of? Pepper. Everything tasted of pepper, even the ice cream, which was black. As for the titular Dalmatians, it was interesting to observe the domestic struggles that Dodie details through the voices of these dogs, which, for the vast majority of the book, was mostly relegated to where the next meal might be found. Though we can understand the language of the dogs, the humans cannot, which Dodie makes a point to repeatedly tell us throughout the book. Pongo, named after the author's real-life Dalmatian, and Mrs. are loving and compassionate protagonists that easily gain the sympathy of the reader as they embark on their harrowing journey to save their 97 puppies from Cruella de Vil, who has kidnapped them in order to skin them and make Dalmatian fur coats, which, <laughs> oh yeah, that's the plot by the way, I just sort of figured you all knew it. Oh, and if you're thrown off by the 97 puppies thing I just said, it's because 101 includes Pongo and Mrs., as well as a stray dog that the humans rescue named Perdita, who uh, ends up helping to nurse the puppies that are not her own. There's like a weird, adulterous tension between Pongo and Perdita whenever Mrs. is not around, so it keeps repeating to himself that she's like a sister and that his wife is actually super hot. We finally reach 101 when you include another adult male Dalmatian that Perdita wants to make puppies with named Prince, so there you go. 101. Oh gee oh boy. The story sort of centers around a concept called starlight barking, which is Dodie Smith's way of playfully explaining why dogs sometimes howl to each other at night. 
When the puppies go missing, and before it's known to the main characters that Cruella de Vil has kidnapped them, Pongo and Mrs. send messages across and well beyond the city of London by passing loud barks and howls from dog to dog. When the messages get to the edge of the city, it's up to whatever dog living on the outskirts of town to go out and pass the message onto the nearest farmhouse dog within barking distance in the countryside. This goes on until any sort of evidence of the puppies is found. It's actually really touching to see this community of unfamiliar dogs band together to help some unknown couple find their pups. One other thing I want to note before moving on is a fairly dark element to this story that I don't really think was intentional and is more so just like very telling of a different time. During a dinner party held at the house of Mr. and Mrs. Dearly, who are the owners of Pongo and Mrs. Oops, I'm sorry, I meant to say the pets of Pongo and Mrs. because I'm quirky. Anyways, this is when Mrs. goes into labor. The owners of the house politely ask the guests to leave as they watch over the birthing process and make sure that Mrs. has everything she needs. All the guests leave but one, Cruella de Vil, who barges into the room where the puppies are being born and discovers that none of them have spots on their fur, which apparently is how all Dalmatians initially look at birth. But this is unbeknownst to Cruella, who immediately instructs the Dearlies to drown them in the nearby lake. It'll be quite easy, said Cruella. I've drowned dozens and dozens of my cat's kittens. She always chooses some wretched alley cat for their father, so they're never worth keeping. Surely you leave her one kitten, said Mrs. Dearly. If I'd done that, I'd be overrun with cats, said Cruella. I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that there's something very disturbing to me about all of this. The method of killing these animals is so specific, and I feel like it's alluding to something that, while I'm sure it still does happen today, unfortunately, it seems like this was a normal thing for people to do at one point. Perhaps even Dodie Smith drew this from personal acquaintances. I understand that Cruella de Vil is a villain in the story, and therefore, her actions don't represent that of a normal person. However, there's just something so sad and accepting about Mrs. Dearly asking if the cat even got to keep one of its own children while the rest were killed. It's kind of messed up and left me with a weird feeling. People can be horrible. Anyhow, fast forward six years and Mr. Michael Moose jumps onto the scene. Disney had optioned the book from Dodie Smith and released their animated film adaptation, changing the title from The 101 Dalmatians to 101 Dalmatians. That wasn't all they changed either, as a few characters were omitted or combined to simplify things. I won't mention them all, but I will say that Perdita was removed and Mrs. was renamed Perdita, who had much less characterization and dialogue this time around and played more as a quiet side character to Pongo. Starlight Barking is now called Twilight Barking for some reason. A lot of the darker themes were unsurprisingly scrapped, like the scene with an evil kid luring the hungry dogs with food and then throwing rocks at them. Some of the main puppies, like Cad Pig, were now gone, as well as Cruella's husband and cat. Mr. and Mrs. Dearly were changed to Roger and Anita Radcliffe, a car chase scene was added, and the overall story was heavily shortened to fit into an hour and 20 minute film. Disney jettisoned a lot of the character development in the beginning of the story, as well as the long distance adventuring that happens later. Surprisingly, Dodie Smith was very happy with these changes, and as I'm sure you already know, the film went on to be a huge success and is still considered to be a classic to this day. In fact, it's probably the main thing you're all familiar with here, unless you count the 90s live adaptation that I'll briefly mention in a bit. Like most book-to-film adaptations, there are pros and cons to both, and overall, I'd say the condensing of the latter half of the story does work in favor of the overall experience. The final chapters of the book were honestly pretty boring to trudge through, and it dragged along as the dogs toured the countryside talking about their next meal. You could argue that the book creates a better sense of epic journey for the main characters, but I feel that that notion is similar to the topic of open world games. Don't make it big just because you think it needs to be big. Fill your world with interesting things and adjust the size of your canvas accordingly. It's just unfortunate that these changes were also at the expense of the character development that the book offered. For example, though Mrs. isn't portrayed as especially smart in the book, it actually goes out of its way to tell you that she isn't. It does give you a real sense of Mrs. as a growing adventurer. We see a real arc from when she first sets off to find her children and laments at leaving her fine cape behind, to a dog that travels large distances to find food, shelter, and helpful strangers when her husband is knocked out and unable to continue the journey. She finds her own strength to save both her pups and her husband, a character progression that is not highlighted within the movie. This film, which was the 17th animated feature by Disney, was the first to use a process called xerography, which allowed for exact reproductions of the animator's original drawings onto cells instead of tracing them in ink. Watching it now, I have to admit, it looks incredible. The characters on screen as well as their movements are also defined and eye-catching. 
Also, the stylistic choice of off-kilter frames over muted colors in the backgrounds only helps these animations to pop even more. No joke, even if you don't watch the whole thing, I do encourage you to at least appreciate some of the visuals here. I also just want to share my appreciation of the Lady and the Tramp Easter eggs that are sprinkled throughout the movie. Moving on. In 1967, which was 12 years after the first book and 6 years after the film adaptation, Dodie Smith released an official sequel titled The Starlight Barking. I didn't read this one, as it trails off separately from where this video is supposed to be heading, but I will say that after reading the synopsis, I kind of want to. Apparently it gets like, supernatural or something? Because all of the humans in the world have fallen asleep, and now the dogs have the ability to fly, and they're never hungry, and they communicate with thought waves. So that sounds kind of cool, right? Almost 30 years later, in 1996, Disney put out the live adaptation, 101 Dalmatians, which many of you around my age might remember. Glenn Close had a pretty notable performance in it as Cruella, and Jeff Daniels was just kind of in it. John Hughes wrote the script, and the movie was directed by the dude that directed Critters, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, The Mighty Ducks, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, Mr. Holland's Opus, and uh, Man of the House. Four years later, in 2000, there was a sequel to the live-action film called 102 Dalmatians. Glenn Close reprised her role, and it was directed by the dude that directed a goofy movie in Tarzan. Wow, fascinating. In 2003, Disney finally decided to release an official sequel to the original 101 Dalmatians animated film. It was called 101 Dalmatians 2 Patches London Adventure, and it was direct to video VHS and DVD, baby. I should note that neither of the sequels to the animated or the live action films respectively have anything to do with Dodie Smith's sequel, A Starlight Barking. So this movie actually had me somewhat entertained. It was during an era when I feel that Disney content still had a tiny bit of soul left in it, which I think would end within the next decade or so. The characters were silly and some of the jokes landed. You have Jason Alexander playing a manipulative corgi that wants to be famous, and Martin Short does the voice for an eccentric beatnik artist named Lars. I am Lars. Also, Barry Bostwick of the Rocky Horror Picture Show fame voices Thunderbolt, who is the star of the Thunderbolt Adventure Hour, a show admired by all the Dalmatian pups. Without getting too much into it, I'll just describe the plot as being somewhat similar to Home Alone 2, but then like, it's not. <laughs> so it's a year after the events of the last film, and Patch the pup finds that he doesn't really fit in with the other puppies. While moving out to a new country home, Pongo, Perdita, and the humans accidentally miscount the puppers and leave Patch behind. Because Thunderbolt, the famous dog that I mentioned earlier, is in town for a celebrity performance, Patch goes to see him and ends up befriending him. And when Thunderbolt is afraid that he's going to be replaced on a show by another celebrity dog, Patch helps him do good deeds to look cool and stuff, since, as his biggest fan, Patch can retell every hero adventure that Thunderbolt had on TV. And then... Uh, George Corgi Stanza tries to usurp Thunderbolt and take over the show because he wants all the lady dogs, even though he's just going to complain about all their imperfections in the doggy diner later to Jerry Terrier. And then Cruella tells the bad guy henchman to go kidnap the puppies. And then, I don't know, <laughs> Patch saves the day. Who cares? <laughs> Really, who cares, guys? Come on. Anyways, something I did like was the whole dynamic of Cruella DeVille getting out of prison and not being allowed to purchase furs due to her probation. <laughs> so she finds Lars the artist and has him painting spots for her so she can get off on it, and it's really weird and funny. What sets her over the edge, however, is that at some point, she feels that Lars is losing his ability to perfectly capture spots on the canvas, even though it looks exactly the same. So she sets out to capture Dalmatians again to give him inspiration. But yeah, that's, that's the movie. In November of the same year, a video game adaptation of this movie was released on the Sony PlayStation. And we did it, you guys. <laughs> you stuck around and we finally arrived at today's topic. You all know Eidos Interactive, who published this game and coincidentally the last game in the complete PlayStation series, but there are actually two separate developers credited, depending on what website you refer to. Oddly enough, they're never both credited at the same time, and sources cite these two developers in a mutually exclusive manner. So the first company, Digital Eclipse Software, was founded in 1992 in Emeryville, California. They mostly ported classic arcade games to various systems, and beginning in 1999, they made licensed Disney games. As 
as well as a slew of handheld games under other licenses, like pre-Disney Marvel, DC, Spyro and Rayman, Fantasy Star, Mortal Kombat, and Grand Theft Auto. In 2003, right around the time they developed 101 Dalmatians 2, Digital Eclipse merged with a company called Imagine Engine to form Backbone Entertainment, and two years later they would again merge with a company called The Collective to form Foundation 9 Entertainment. During all of these mergers, the company, or rather companies, would go on to mostly make digital ports of classic arcade and console video games on the Xbox 360 and PS3. They also made Death Jr. and its sequels, which is way cooler than the not-so-great Nintendo DS port of Age of Empires that they developed. This lineage of development companies is cited as going defunct in 2015. However, years prior to this, in 2007, some of the developers from the initial company, Digital Eclipse, had split off to form Other Ocean Interactive with a few of the current, at the time, developers from Backbone. Amongst a bunch of other random releases, they developed the 2019 remake of Medieval, or is it pronounced Medieval? I don't know. They also worked under EA on The Simpsons Tapped Out, which I remember being a popular mobile game for a minute, and they did a Nintendo 3DS port of Minecraft. In 2015, Other Ocean rekindled Digital Eclipse to be what it now is today, which is a project intended to mimic the preservation practices and overall restoration purposes of the Criterion Collection. And this holds true when you look at what the company has developed so far, though it's mostly been compilations. In order to streamline the process of porting these games to modern systems, Digital Eclipse actually developed a tool that allows them to decompile the code from older games into a machine-readable format called Eclipse Engine. You've got Mega Man Legacy Collection, the Disney Afternoon Collection, Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection, SNK 40th Anniversary Collection, Disney Classic Games Aladdin and the Lion King, Samurai Showdown Neo Geo Collection, Blizzard Arcade Collection, Disney Classic Games Collection, and they're working on the unreleased at the time of this video, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Cowabunga Collection. The second company that sources lists as the developer of the game is called Santa Cruz Games, and is not to be confused with a Peruvian game company of the same name that seems to have been active from 2015 to 2017. Formed in 2001 in, of course, Santa Cruz, California, they made at least five plug-and-play games that I know of, three of which are Marvel licensed and include this infamous controller. One is a Power Rangers sword game, and then there was a Star Wars game with a gun. Amongst other systems, they did a few PlayStation and Nintendo DS games. The website that still exists for them is pretty strange. There's a tombstone that shows the years that the company was active, which tells us that it ended in 2010. And if you click on any of the games, it says this. All games developed by SCG were created by a crew of amazing people and creatures. Scrappy and playful, hardworking misfits dedicated to shipping on time with the best quality. We were Santa Cruz Games, a different type of game creator. Long lost and now extinct. Thank you for attending the funeral. So that's kind of sad, but it's cool that this is there 12 years later. Anyways, let's play this game. Well, loopity loopity loop, this is a poop loop, it's a four second loop of poop, touch on the nose, go boop. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, you, you gotta get past this screen fast, because this four second loop of music can make you go crazy. It's mind numbing. And sadly, that will be the case throughout the rest of the game. All of the music during this experience is really, really bad. You know, boisterous, pulsating, energetic circus music can be pretty cool. I'm a big old fan of Nino Rota's music in the Fellini films, and that stuff will make cotton candy come out of your ears. This music, however, is like the auditory version of typing once upon a time on a page over and over and over and over and over and over again without ever writing anything else. It's a groundhog's four seconds of sound. And while we're on the topic of audio, all of the sound effects in the game are not mixed well at all. Digging and busting boxes and cars passing by will break you. Jolting sounds repeat themselves ad nauseum through the speakers and are very likely to outflinch the flinchiest of finches. I'm just saying everyone, if you're gonna play this, turn down the volume and put on your favorite album, I highly recommend that. 
Starting up the game, we quickly learn that all of the narrative will unfortunately be told through stills from the film, accompanied with a text that feels like it was written by a nine-year-old. The goal of the first level is to arbitrarily chase after a truck, but you don't actually need to chase it. Rather, you can just progress down this lazily designed level, collecting things until you get to said truck. The controls are as follows. X is jump, circle is roll, and I don't know what actual purpose it served, but I did it the whole time because it's Sonic. Square is bark, which can stun enemies for like a millisecond. You can run by holding L1 or R1, which I think was a good choice considering that it frees up your thumbs for the face buttons. Triangle is sniff and dig, which lets you find key items. And considering that this was a very late PlayStation 1 game, you can definitely use the analog stick to move if you don't want to use the D-pad. Yeah, the PS2 had come out three years earlier in 2000. So here's the thing. Before I move on to inevitably complain about other stuff, I don't actually hate this game. I even kind of like it. It's broken up into almost 30 levels, and the design and goal of each level slowly gets better as you go along. It's mindless, yes. It's simplistic, absolutely. But it scratches an itch that I think we all need to just admit is there. Go from A to Z and collect things along the way. I beat it in less than three hours, and there was hardly ever a moment that I felt stuck, save for a missed key or two. I was just flowing along as I chatted with friends, and there was an element of escapism there. It's like coloring in a coloring book while talking to someone or listening to an audiobook. For the most part, you'll be collecting items, doing slippery platforming, avoiding bad guys, finding keys to open gates, saving puppies, dodging traffic, etc, etc. Occasionally there are bonus levels where you quickly collect things. It's all very straightforward and done on a level by level basis. Aside from the audio, I think that the biggest crime committed in this game is the way that the story is handled, and I'm not just talking about the lazy use of still images from the film. No. Actually, the big problem is that you'd have to have just watched the movie for any of the narrative segments to make any sense. Absolutely zero context or exposition is given to the player. Check this out. In the movie, the opening scene gives us insight into the television program that the puppies, Patch in particular, are obsessed with. Every night, they crowd the living room to watch the Thunderbolt Adventure Hour, which stars Thunderbolt as the hero of the day. Patch looks up to him as an idol, so naturally, when there's an announcement that Thunderbolt will be in town for an event, Patch gets excited about this. The family accidentally leaves Patch behind the next morning when they embark on their big move to the new country house. So, he decides to go to the event and see Thunderbolt. A bunch of things happen that lead to Patch and Thunderbolt interacting with each other. When Thunderbolt is misled to believe that he's going to be replaced on the show by another dog, he comes up with the idea to prove himself by going around town doing good deeds and showing the world his true heroism in an effort to save his job. Because Patch has an encyclopedic knowledge of all the episodes of the show, Thunderbolt feels that he can help him do this. So he lies to him about some lost episode of the Thunderbolt Adventure Hour that featured something called a junior deputy test which allows young pups to prove their heroic abilities for a chance to be on the show. Using this as an incentive, he gets Patch to help him out. Okay, <laughs> now let's look at how the game handles this. We skip any establishment of the Thunderbolt Adventure Hour, so we have no idea of what that or who Thunderbolt is. We open on the story as Patch wakes up to find his family gone, and awkwardly gives us this information in first person. One beautiful morning, comma, I was fast asleep. When suddenly a noise woke me up. I decided to go to the kitchen to investigate. No one was around. As I got closer, I realized that the sound was coming from the window. And boy, was I surprised by what I saw. My whole family getting into a moving van, ready to go. I tried to get to them, but I was not quick enough. Now I need your help to get back to my family. So then you jump into the actual game and do all of the straightforward things I've already mentioned. Jumping, collecting, you get it. There are no plot forward elements here whatsoever. After about five levels of this, we're treated to the second narrative segment of the game, which is no longer in first person. Ready for it? Junior Deputy Test, what show was that in? Oh, one of the lost episodes, but I only give it to pups who I think might be worthy. And who knows? If you do a good job, maybe I'll even let you be on the show with me. Really? Sure, kid. I'm the star, aren't I? Aren't you? Aren't you what? <laughs> what show are you talking about? Who are you? What is this? What is happening? Who am I? I mean, this is a major oversight in setting down the foundation for a very simple narrative and a very simple game. And this is Disney we're talking about. This ain't no Phoenix games. I mean, Disney has greenlit its fair share of things that I do not like, but even still, they're known to have that Nintendo seal of quality sheen to everything they put their name on. It's pretty baffling to see how incompetent the storytelling is in this game when you remind yourself of that. 
Like, this game doesn't just omit extra bits of exposition, it completely forgets to materialize a grounded plot for the characters to stand on. <laughs> I guess you better also get mom and dad to buy the DVD, kids. It's the companion piece, you little turds. Some of you right now are saying, Bidya, why are you criticizing a 20-year-old children's video game on the PlayStation 1? This is a waste of energy and a waste of our time, and you are a loser and we hate you. Jeez, God, chill out, guys. That is a very strong choice of words. <laughs> Look, <laughs> Just because something is intended to appeal to children doesn't necessarily mean that it can get away with being terrible, and I'm mostly referring to the narrative aspect here. Who started the notion that children's media doesn't need to be good? Why is it okay to insult their intelligence? Why is it wrong for people like me to complain about it and expect more? The kids deserve better, y'all. Expose them to the good stuff. Build better people, you morons. And I also want to clarify, I don't think that every piece of children's media needs to be educational or have some lesson of the day. It should be allowed to sometimes just be fun, but also intelligently made. There are plenty of great children's games out there that have done this. Or a good example of a kid's cartoon would be Rugrats. Compare the earlier seasons to the later ones. For a while, the show was just a fun, gross-out bit of adventuring that appealed to all of us. Then somewhere around the time that the first film came out and Dill was born, it got all preachy and every single episode had to suddenly have some moral message being shoved down your throat about, like, the importance of sharing or something. <laughs> oh my god. I am getting way off track here. <laughs> the point is that kids games can and should be good. And when they're not, we should be allowed to say so. Respect the kids. Hey, come on. Here's a fun thing. <laughs> no matter how uninteresting the last frame of your screen in each level might be, it always turns into the front page of a newspaper. <laughs> Go get them, Patch. <laughs> Who's reading this? Hey, honey. Did you, did you see the paper? The, there's a dog, and he's standing there. I don't know, we're supposed to be rooting for him to do something. I, I don't know what. Go patch. Sometimes it was frustrating to avoid enemies while trying to dig for key items, since the bark stunned them for such a short period of time, but you get used to it. The controls feel slippery and slidey, as you could probably guess. The goals of each level can be quite arbitrary most of the time, usually in the form of collect this very specific number of bones, or meat, or donuts, or jump over a set number of royal guards. Towards the end of the game, it does make more sense when the goals tend to be rescue dogs from Cruella and her henchmen. Sometimes things get very Doom-like with keys that are all different colors. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't think of a single other thing to say about this game. I mean, it, it starts and it ends. Um, if you like throwing on a simple game while you listen to something else, this works for that, I swear. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that it took me less than three hours to complete. Let's see a speedrun of this, people. That could be cool, eh? I want to give a very special thank you to all of my Patreon friends. You guys are amazing and incredibly supportive. Also, thank you to any of you subscribing to the channel. It really helps. I just got over like a month and a half long thing that prevented me from making this video, so thank you all for being so patient and cool about it. I'm hoping to eventually be able to do this full time and pump at least one video out a week, but as it is with work and life and all the other dumb stuff, well, you all know how that goes. I'm really excited for the next video, actually, so I will see you all soon. Be nice to people. Bye.